also live on YouTube, and then we are going to be rocking. And we'll let the questions build up anyway. Uh, the very bottom of the screen, if you if you hit that little question mark, that's where the uh, you can put your question. That's typically where I look. The comments kind of flat. What's up, Shelby? Good to see you. That's where I put the uh, where I go to to read the questions. All right, we're live. It worked. So we are live on YouTube and we're live on Instagram. Fantastic. Let me go sit this back up. You know the wife's gonna want this later. All right, your friends outside the door, honey. All right, let's pop into the Q&A as well, YouTube. I'll um, field them questions, too, on there. We got nine Q&As lined up. Let's go to question number one. How many locks do you aim for in a pairing, and how long do you wait in between pairings? Fantastic question by Central Coast Pythons. Thank you so much. Um, I just do the standard. It's pretty much a hobby standard, one lock per month. Um, a lot of breeders do run short on males, and they don't want to overuse their males. If you have one male laying around doing nothing, then I would go every two or three weeks. I think every 30 days is fine, 30 to 40 days even. Um, another general rule of thumb would be one lock every shed cycle. Um, if you're really dialed in and you know when your female is developing follicles, you could probably get it done in one or two locks, but sometimes, and it doesn't always go as planned. Some girls, you know, they'll, they'll start off at 10 millimeters. That's like usually when they start developing their follicles so here's the thing some girls will start developing on their own and some girls won't and when i so when when they don't start developing you have to introduce a male to get them to start introducing their follicles a uh, standard resting point would be like five to eight millimeters and when you're palpating that's going to feel like like those tiny beads that you put on like a bracelet like like that it'd be very hard to feel them on a big girl um, once you get that lock in they're at 10 millimeters, it's going to feel like peas. And then that's like green light time to go. And then typically you get one lock per month. And on average, they'll gain about 10 millimeters per month. So you get 10, 20, 30, 40. And then they ovulate around 40 to 45, I believe. They start glowing usually around 30 ish, I would guess, which is, um, they'll have their pre ovulation shed, which is about 45 days typically before they ovulate and then they're going to be in a glowing phase get one or two locks it's also a really good time to steal clutches what i mean is if you have another male in there and then they start glowing the final two locks that male if he's a strong male will often take the clutch so yeah once a month uh, when in doubt just keep breeding once a month until they ovulate there you go so and and <laughs> it's kind of embarrassing i've paired one female literally for like two or three years straight <laughs> once a month so like i ain't no genius at it like and it we're dealing with nature it's give and take so you just you just never know sometimes but them girls that are like consistent year after year like like justin uh Kabulka said in his last podcast with um mj at the snake trap sessions he once a female lays he will start pairing her again seven months after she lays and um it's something to pay attention to. If you wait too long, you, you might miss a window, perhaps. Um, you know, and that, that's assuming they're eating. So, all right, there you go. Let's move on to the next one. Thank you. Apex, Apex, what's your dream snake? I think I answered this the other night. I, I don't think it's been made yet. Um, I'm just really loving, like, what I'm doing. I'm loving the Desert Ghost Clown angle. I'm excited to start working Ultramel. Um, I think there's a lot of potential with super gravel cl uh, clown combos which has not been done or at least shown yet. Um, so it's just a lot of, every project, I guess, I, the way I look at that question is every project, I have a dream snake in every project. Um, I can't just pick one. So I'm kind of looking at sort of like, thanks for, appreciate it, Shelby, you love the shirt. I'm kind of looking at it like that. Um, every project has like that, that end goal. And I love pretty much all my projects equally. Thanks for the question. Apex mutations. Right, going to the next Drunken Hog Barbecue. It's my boy Shriver. Everybody will give him a follow. Drunken Hog Barbecue. That's some wood fired authentic barbecue. I know you guys have seen that on my story before. Fantastic small business. Small businesses need to love right now, guys. They really do. You know, and that even comes down to when you're when you're purchasing snakes, you know, I mean, buy what you want, but if you can support 
the, the, the small breeders, you know, um, even big breeders too, but people that actually breed their own snakes, breeders that are producing their own stock, support those breeders. I would encourage you to always support those breeders. I personally do not support flippers. Um, they're part of the industry, part of the hobby, but man, the mom and pop shops, that is where the love needs to go right now more than ever. All right, the question, how long did it take you to grow that mustache? Man, I grew up, my pops, he had a mustache like my whole life. And and pops, you know, pops, where you at? You in here? I haven't been paying attention. I ain't pops don't rock rock the stash like that. So I'm bringing it back. I'm bringing it back. It's like a throwback for me. So, so uh, anyway, appreciate the question, brother. I'll talk to you soon. We'll see you in person soon too. All right, moving along. Tell you what, Apex, he's the most popular on the questions. What direction are you thinking of taking the Ultra Mel? Uh, we saw the Ultra Mel Tri Stripes. Those are really cool. I think Spot Nose worked into it would be great. Ultra Mel Clowns, that's like a fantastic platform for color and pattern. I think it's limitless. I think it's the ground floor. Um, the benefit of the Ultra Mel Project and even the Monarch Project, which is very similar, I'm strictly Ultra Mel, is that they're so similar, we can look at what each one does, just like highway and freeway, and we can we can ping off of that and get ideas for new directions. Because um, I feel like the ball python hobby is, I feel like it's one collective collaboration, even if it is not a direct collaboration. Um, we're all in this together, and and um, we got to stand strong to keep our, our hobby moving forward. And it's, it's getting mainstream or popular. And, you know, everybody that even posts what they're doing, sharing their story, their passion, their love, it all goes to the greater good. Um, you know, your win doesn't take away from me. And I hope you feel the same about me. Like we're all in this together. So I appreciate the question. Apex mutations. What is your best advice for a newbie asking for a friend? Mutation, mutation, Billy in the house. Um, you know, it's a, that's such a loaded question. Um, you know, and I, I, I try to give it like a different angle than, than you often hear, which I can't even think of now, but I would say really just, just get in it for the right reasons. Like really ask yourself, what is my why? And, and remember always where you came from, because there's going to be times when you walk in your snake room and knock on wood, we've been blessed. We haven't had too many disasters, but you know, people, sometimes they open a tub and there's a deceased snake or there's a slugged out clutch or you have a relationship that goes sour or you can't sell a snake or you have the coronavirus that's affecting something Like you really got to find your why dig within and always keep that passion um, and, and have people around you that that you lift up so that if you ever are down, they come back full circle and they lift you up, too. I think that's huge. I think it's underrated. Um, and just have fun. I think the people that have the most fun are winning. Appreciate the question, Billy. All right, let's see where we're at here. Yeah. With the whistle, we got a little kitty light tonight. <clears throat> and I don't want to see any uh, any uh, YouTube questions. I'm on Instagram as well. That's where that's where all the the main questions are coming, guys. On YouTube, feel free to pop in questions there. I'll certainly take a look. At that, what is your breeding routine for a male? How often? Oh, we are Paul. Okay, there we go. We're back. What is your breeding routine for a male? How often is she going to? How often is he he going to females, and when does he rest? It's a great question. Appreciate your question, mere mortal morphs. Um, I heard you can breed males back to back to back to back days, and then give them like a week off. For me, I, I don't like. I don't, I don't like breeding males like back-to-back -back days. Occasionally I will, especially if I'm behind on females um, that, are, that are, you know, needing a lock. I might sneak in a back-to-back -back pairing. I like to do a lock, which normally if I introduce a male and I come check them the next morning, they're going to be locked. I ain't taking him out then because they're locked. So a male is always going to spend two nights in the tub of a female. Unless I happen to be there late in the evening and he's unlocked, I'll try to get him out of there so he can start his rest period. Um, but typically it's two nights on, one night off minimum, but I like to go three nights off to two nights off. So it's like breed for two days, get at least two to three days off, and then back at it. That's assuming I need it. If I, if, if I don't have girls ready for 
that specific mail. He'll just wait until the next month when he needs it. But most of my mails work very hard to um, within you know an integrity reason. Eat them once a week. Uh, I don't like pairing them the same night they eat. Um, I don't pair males during shed cycle. So males get a break during shed the night they eat, and then two to three days in between pairings. Appreciate the question. Have you ever had a female, this is in the comments, have you ever had a female lay and shed eggs the next day? They just happen to me, should I be worried? I would never be worried, anything happens. Um, I've had females uh, take so long to ovulate after their pre-ovulation shed that they are about to ovulate and also in shed. I've had that happen before. Um, I've had girls, uh, I think one uh, waiting on her to, uh, to lay and uh, she was about to shed and then she laid. So. I wouldn't worry about that. They definitely aren't always on timing. And then another, while we're kind of on that topic, um, sometimes you miss the ovulation. I don't always see the ovulations. And I have had males lock females after they ovulate. So also don't let that throw you off. You don't want to pair after ovulation, but if you happen to miss it and you're just not sure, um, and you do happen to see a lock, she could have ovulated already, especially if that's a super stud male. Let's take a look at the next question. What do you do when a male doesn't want to breed? Maybe give him like a week off. Uh, I would do that. Um, by the way, guys, are we still live on Instagram? Can someone give me like a thumbs up in the comments? I just haven't seen much come in. I want to make sure we're still streaming because it paused a little bit ago. Any feedback in, on an IG, that'd be great. Um, anyway, um, yes. All right, cool. If, if a male doesn't want to, thank you guys, appreciate the thumbs up. Uh, if, if a male doesn't want to breed, I just give him a break maybe for a week or two, or I would try a different female there, especially if it's like a young male. Um, I've never like done too many crazy tricks. Um, maybe if I happen to have another male shed, I'll toss a shed in with him. I've heard of people popping a male, getting some sperm plugs on their finger and wiping it on a female's back. I've tried that a couple of times. I think it's been two years since I've even done that. Uh, but typically it's just persistence, patience, um, and, and not doing it too much. Like, you know, I, I'll get, if he doesn't lock, I'm going to give him a week off. I ain't going to look at him. And then I'm just going to probably put him with a different female. And then eventually it just works, and then they're just stud breeders. So patience is probably the, the main answer for that one, I would say. Okay, moving on. Who are you wearing, celebrity? <laughs> Who are you wearing? All right, so so the hat, I just saw this laying around in my stepson's room. I was like, that's, that's dope. I'm, I'm, I'm yanking it with his permission. I stole it. Um, the, the shirt I ordered offline, this is inspired by Ed Bassmaster. You already know, like that. Um, I feel like I kind of look like Mario with like the, the, the stash and a little bit of burns and the, the, the red and blue. But so uh, I don't know. Just, I'm just being wild, just having fun. I appreciate the question. Apex mutation. All right. Any other? Let's see what's going on here. Uh, opinion on Hurricane versus Blitz trick? If you can, I tell you what. Um, I'm in the Hurricane Project. Um, all respect. Uh, you know, I really never try to ever disrespect any uh, direct comp competing projects. For instance, I'm strictly highway. Um, of course, freeway is you know you know very similar to highway um, to each their own. Of course, on that, and I always respect the competing projects that are in the same niche. Um, I really don't have the experience to speak on Blitz or Trick. I will say this. They look very, very similar. They're all beautiful. Thanks for the question, Mr. Dillon. First quad recessive you would go for. That is like so far out of like my range where I'm at now. I'm barely scratching, you know, double, double recessive. So, um, oh, I don't know. I'll just throw something out for fun. I got to give you an answer on this. You got to go clown. Desert Ghost, Ultra Mel. Think of that. Wow. Clown, Desert Ghost, Ultra Mel. That would be sick. Or Clown, Desert Ghost, Monarch. That would be dank. Um, so Clown, Desert Ghost, Ultra Mel. And for the fourth one, Puzzle. Yay. Yes. That would be dank. Look at that. Clown, Desert Ghost, Ultra Mel, and Puzzle. Yes. That would be cool. All right. Uh, da, 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 da. Take a look at the comments. What was the question Apex asked last night that you said you would answer tonight? I think, well, Apex, you have to ask it again. He already has a couple loaded up in there. So, uh, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll probably get to that. I'm just checking the, the comments. Oh, give me a block in the YouTube feed. I should use this hand. Sorry, guys. All right. 
Puzzle Tri Stripe. Has that been done? I don't think Puzzle Tri Stripe's been done. I love Tri Stripe, man. I love my Tri Stripe mail. He's in quarantine. I'm going to start showing him more here soon. All right. And I'm not reading these before I click on them. So who knows what these questions are when they pop up? How are you dealing with Corona in the U.S.? Love from the U.K. Well, love back from the U.S. to the U.K. Appreciate the question. Golden Exotics U.K. Um, I mean, look, I'm in the Cincinnati metro area. Um, we do have cases around us. You know, my wife works at a bank. Um, she's considered essential business. Uh, fortunately, she started a vacation. She's going to be home the next 10 days. They actually did have a case inside of her business last week. I wasn't very happy with how they handled it. She works in like a building with like a thousand other people on like, you know, it's like the size of a super Walmart, you know, two floors, like a thousand employees. Um, there was a case on like one side of the building and, you know, it was confirmed like Thursday, I think, come Friday, they, they, they actually told the new, the local news stations, but that bank is in 10 different states and they would not indicate which state it was, but the internal employees got the email saying, hey, it was at your campus. Um, we sent home the people that were on their team and that sat around them, but since it wasn't in your wing of the building, you got to stay, which I think is not fair. I think they should have sent home the whole building. We're dealing with it. We're healthy people. Um, you know, we're definitely not part of the hysteria. Any of y'all that follow me on Facebook, you know, I, do, I don't do it anymore because at this point, I don't even think the coronavirus is funny. I got I got friends that are being impacted financially on this, and um, I certainly don't want to, you know, push it, you know, forward anymore and just keep things calm and do our part in, in self-quarantine. Uh, we are staying away from people. I'm staying away from Walmarts. I feel like Walmarts are the breeding ground central. I think any grocery store is many go in them. Like when I go inside Walmarts, I do. I wear N95 mask and goggles. Um, you know, not because I'm one of those, like, I'm like freaked out about the, the virus or I'm scared. It's just because I, I wear, I wear, um, N95 mask anyway, when I deal with rats, not always with the snakes. I'm, I'm cleaning snake, snake tubs, hardcore. I'll wear a mask. We happen to have a nice supply of N95. It's not like some crazy amount where we should be do donating the hospitals. I got to work too. So you know, I have a small allotment, um, maybe like 10 masks. It's not, you know, nothing major. Um, and I, yeah, yeah, I reuse them. I know you, they're like apparently one time use and good for, for 30 minutes or something I heard, but anyway, um, I don't like breathing in the dust and this and that. So I try to protect the lungs when you do this day in and day out, you know, or 30, 40, 50 years, I'm not there yet. I want to take care of myself. So anyway, um, we're dealing with it. It's fine. Um, I'm coming off of the, the best week ever in snake sales. Um, probably a lot of it had to do with it's tax season. People love to spend tax checks on, on snakes. And, you know, like I saw, I saw some memes in some Facebook groups where, where people were like making memes, like, you know, they're going to give out the stimulus check and this person goes and buy this reptile. And then Trump's like, you weren't supposed to do that. Well, it's like, hold on, hold on. <laughs> hey, we're all small businesses here. Wherever they spend that money is stimulating the economy in some way, because I certainly turn around and pump the money into the economy all the time as well. So I think it's hundred percent acceptable that people like to spend stimulus checks, tax returns on reptiles, because that is part of the economy and people's livelihoods. So anyway, there's my, my rant on that, man. I hope you guys are well. I hope, uh, I hope you're at least able to take a step back and have some good family time. Maybe, um, you know, you're just focusing more on, on good mental health and, you know, you're able to just, I don't know, slow down and smell the roses. So was they, you know, spring is coming. So appreciate the question. Thank you very much. All right. I think I just paused it or something. Here we go. Okay. PVC, melamine, plastic, or metal racks? Look, I like all of it. I think do what works best for you and what's what's available to you. Um, for us, we use the expanded PVC foam, which um, fortunately Home Depot started carrying. It's kind of hit or miss. You might need to ask your local Home Depot or Lowe's to order it. Um, but um, it's light. Melamine is, is heavy. Uh, it's probably like cheaper. Uh, maybe the same cost ish, but um, and I think it might warp over time if I'm correct. I'm not sure on that, but the PVC is like kind of like a lifetime sort of deal. Doesn't rot or you know this and that. Um, the you know the metal racks, Freedom Breeder, ARS. I mean, those are awesome. Look, if you know a welder, 
you can get the dimensions on them racks and you can pay a welder to make them for you too. That's something to think about. And that's something not talked about. I don't want to steal someone's patent or anything or get in any kind of legal trouble, but you know, you sometimes if you're on a look, them racks are expensive. I mean, I don't even look at them because I know it's out of my, my pay grade, but um, a freedom breeder rack or ARS rack for a, for a standard unit that I think is like four wide by 12 tall, you're looking at like three grand ish or something like that, two to three grand. That's, that's a lot of money. Whereas I can build a PVC rack that also goes higher. I build mine custom 13 to 14 tall. Um, they, they're a little bit more compact and space efficient wise. Um, they look great. I love how they look. I'm not saying they look better, but you know, they look just as presentable. And they do the job. Um, but at the same time, you know, and I'll admit, we, we've had some some mishaps of our racks. They're not perfect. The shelves would be uneven a little bit because, you know, I'll be in, I'll get aid and my wife to, to come over. And I'm, she holds it and I'm zipping the screws in. It's just, it's not always like, you know, perfect. So if you're, if you're OCDC, man, OCD, I'm thinking ACDC. If you're OCD, don't do like the self builds because it will drive you nuts. And it started to drive me nuts when we first built them, but I let go of that real quick because I had no other choice. Um, just do what you can. Like I'd love to pick up ARS or Freedom Breeder Rack. You know, maybe Shelby. I was going to tell you when I was talking to you on the phone today. Um, if you're ever selling any, hit me up. I would like to bring in at least one of them to try it out for sure. Um, but you know we're improving as we go um look i'll admit it um we we had a mishap on a couple of our racks we built where the gap is too big you know I, I, if any of y'all follow me on my stories you'll see that i um i gap them with three cds so i and I, I probably should put out like a public service announcement i wouldn't go with three cds i'd go like one or two or maybe find something else that's different and maybe like a one and a half type gap because the problem is when I present for an hour or two, especially with the hatchling thing, and they want to get out, they're like pressing their nose up against the corner where the tub meets the uh, PVC. And, you know, I've had a couple, um, fortunately, they're holdbacks. So I'm dealing with it. It, it. Look, it doesn't affect anything. It's more of an aesthetic thing. But I have a couple snakes that have rubs underneath their chin. They don't have double chins like me, but in fact, their chin's tucked in. And on pictures, you can't see it. And some of it slipped by me for a while. Because hatchlings, I sell and move them out quickly. But if you know if a snake's been in there a while, and I you know feeding like week in, week out, um, I happen to notice I it's rare that you flip the snake over, but it's hard to, or you like hold them. You have to hold them above your head and look at them. And I'm like, wow, some of my snakes got rubs, you know, like almost like a little scab on each side. And look, we're dealing with it. They're still eating, you know, and and they're doing fine. But that and, and that like really actually put me in a bad mind space for a couple of days. Um, and I had to reframe it. Uh, I was talking to my buddy, you know, um, ridiculous Martin, uh, you know, Russ Martin, one of my best friends. Uh, I told him about this, discovered this recently, actually. And look, man, you can't go back and, and change the past. So we're fixing it. And I'm actually, a, a bro I'll probably make a video. On, I actually purchased blank CDs and I'm going to glue down two CDs under the front of each tub to close that gap some. Um, another thing that didn't help in that was the V18s from Vision that I bought. I don't know if they still make them like this. I'm talking when I bought these back in 2014, 2015. If you, and any of you that own V18s, you should test this because it's something you're going to want to address. On, okay, I wish I had a tub here. I'm looking for something. Okay, so terrible example but say this is the front of the tub you know you're pulling it out of the rack forget about this top part this is the front lip on the inside like right here where the snake snout would be trying to get out you know this is the front this is the inside if you rub your finger that every single tub has like two or three grooves where their mold created a rough spot it's like an endemic groove so you add in a gap that's too big plus a groove on the inside and a snake trying to get out, especially during, you know, doing their head like this, especially during presenting, and you're going to get rub marks. So that is actually something that I'm, uh, you know, dealing with. Any of the snakes I sell don't have that. But when, when there comes a time in the future when I do go to sell some proven breeders, there are going to be some that has scars underneath the chin. So I re look, things happen. And look, 
like I've said in the last couple pod, not I call these podcasts now, but live streams, you're always going to have issues when you keep snakes. No one has a perfect like year. Like I don't care who you are. You're going to have something happen. And that could be anything. It could be an issue with a customer. It could be an issue with a friend or a mentor, or it could be, it could be an issue with a shipment or it can be an issue with a snake or a snake slugs out or you didn't hit them odds, anything, a rat supplier. Um, and this is currently an issue that I have identified. So I reframed it where, Hey, I am glad that I found this out because I can stop this in its tracks. So how I fix this, like I said, I'm closing the gap on all my racks. Any rack that I build in the future will have a less gap. It'll be a smaller gap. And um, I bought sanding paper for plastic tubs. You start with 1,000 grit, then you do 2,000, then you do 3,000 grit, and I'm going to sand it down smooth and polish it at the end. So I'm going to fix this problem, and I'm just going to move forward. So there's that. And if I do go to sell like a proven breeder that happened, there's like, I think in my whole collection of like 250 heads, there's about 15 snakes that do have little scars from, from past rubs when they were in my V18s. You know, it's something that I'm able to, A, tell the buyer, potentially maybe I'll discount a little bit. They're still in good health. Don't get me wrong. They're in great health. They're eating. It's more of an aesthetic thing. So anyway, I think it's important that um, people that do these or that are, you know, uh, given information, own your mistakes, own your shortcomings, um, because it really makes you relatable to your customer and your fan base, because we all go through those. I don't care who you are. No one's perfect. No one is perfect. Trust me. The stories I've heard about what breeders have gone through behind the scenes that they haven't said publicly will blow your mind. So we all get through it. And, 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 and that's, that's something you should always be proud of when you move past things. So, all right, guys, that's, that's, that's my rant. It feels good for me to get that off my chest because I'm I'm not that has put me in a bad headspace like the last week. So anyway, glad to move past that and rectify that. Like my friend Martin said, that's all you can do, baby. And, and I'm I'm thankful I did. So here we go. Okay, going on to the next. I'm gonna try to use this hand so I quit blocking the camera on the YouTube. What temperature and humidity um, should a ball python be kept at? And that's another subjective thing. Um, one of the most beautiful things about this hobby is that anything works. It really does. Like, man, you can get eggs a hundred different ways. And I love that. You talk to different breeders. You talk to, you're like, what do you do? And they're like, they're doing something completely different than me. And they're getting eggs and I'm getting eggs. Now, I would tell you what, going back to Billy's question, advice for a beginner, this is also something that I would Definitely encourage because it throws people off a lot. What works for me might not work for you, and what works for me can all and what you're doing as differently can also work for you. If that made sense, but it's like there's a hundred different ways. Some people keep their snakes at a consistent 84 degrees. I've heard some people keep their snakes at a consistent 86 degrees, and that is ambient temp with no hot spots, and they get eggs just fine. No slugs, great production. Me. And to answer your question, if you want to do what I do, but you have to you have to realize I'm in Cincinnati. I have a certain climate I'm in. You might be in Florida. It might not work for you. But actually, I think they all work kind of regardless where you're at because you can have a controlled environment in your snake room. If you do have – hey, straight fire, good to see you. If you have a, a separate um, environment like in your house, like a designated room, you can climate control that. Personally for me – Here's what I like to do for my snakes, um, and, and I'm proud that I really don't get any slugs, the occasional rare slug. I mean, if I get 200 eggs in a year, um, I'm probably averaging under like five slugs, and that's really good numbers. Um, I do an ambient of 78 to 79. I used to run 80 to 81, and I found better luck going a little cooler for the ambient. When I say ambient, that's like the air in the room. And that's also the air inside the tub. Um, I run a very small hot spot for belly heat. I use three to four inch heat tape on the back. The back of the tub, I recessed the, 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 the shelf that the tub slides on where the heat tape goes across. It's recessed a little bit so that the tub doesn't rub up against that heat tape. There are a couple racks that don't have recesses 
Um, and you can just put packing tape and keep an eye on it and make sure. That's another thing to keep an, an eye on it. You don't want the bottom of your tubs to be rough. If they are, sand that down. We had to do that too. Um, it's always adjusting, monitoring. Oh, and I'm going to stop myself right now. I keep telling myself during the day to tell you guys this. Check your probes. Make sure they're in place. Make sure they're secure because um, I had a, a friend recently tell me that, you know, I think his probe malfunctioned or whatever, but it, you know, it hurt or fried a couple snakes. Keep an eye on that, man. You, it's not all about the glitz and glamour and flashing of taking these photos and social media. You got to get in there and you got to operate your collection. And, and you, you have to look ahead. You need to check. You need to put yourself in check all the time. Where am I messing up? Where are my shortcomings? How are my temps? Um, right now, I mean, my phone's live, but I, I can tell you what my temperatures are right now and my humidity remotely through internet. Um, I got a few people that can log into that that also get alerts. Um, as well. I got security cameras. I am not the only person that gets alerts on this stuff. Like I have eyes. I have a team around me. I have eyes in the sky. Like you have to have, you have to, <laughs> you have to have backup upon backup upon backup upon backup. We got dogs. We got guns. Like, I mean, I don't mean to get on that rant, but you know what I mean? Like we, it, it's like you, you got to have backups, man, like on everything. But to answer your question, I like a 79 to 80 to 78 uh, ambient temp on my hot spot, my very small hot spot in the back on the on the belly. I love, um, and it really depends on the side of the rack. I got some snakes in the bottom where it's 88 degrees. The very top on some racks, it's 92. <clears throat> um, pretty much in the 88 to 92 range, I would say 90% of my tubs are right at 90 degrees on the hot spot, and that is a surface temperature. One thing that is also, I feel like, not discussed enough in this hobby is every snake breeder should own a temp gun. Like, I, I need next time I do this, which I will be here tomorrow um, at 9 Eastern Standard Time, I need a temp gun. And it blows my mind how many keepers don't have a temp gun. Like, are you kidding me? They don't know the difference between a surface hot spot and ambient temperature. And it is one of my biggest pet peeves. Like I have literally, and I'm not tooting my horn, I have purchased, he, I had this one person that bought like a, a $90 leopard from me or something a while ago. And that, you know, I was helping him, he had like a tank and I was helping him mod it out to make it work. I was like, you need a temp gun. He was like, I don't have money. I bought him one and just shipped it to him. I was like, oh my gosh, you got to know what your hotspot is. So they're like $18 on Amazon. It's like, it's like a, it's like a, a little gun that has a laser and it reads the surface temp, not not the air temp. And it's also a good way to check your air temp because it usually matches like if it's just a, you know, an animate ob object in the room. But you need to know what the temperature is right above your hot spot. And it blows my mind how many snake breeders don't have don't have temp guns. Jesus Christ. Probably twenty dollars. But anyway. All right, so there's that rant for tonight. There's the, that tonight's rant on attempt guns. I'm going to make a post about that. Um, get you a temp gun and get you some, uh, you know, do what works for you. Try different things. But once you get there, keep it consistent. Consistency is key, baby. All right, where are we at? How many females would you put a male to for his first year? Um, I like my males to be about a year old and eight to 900 grams. Uh, at that point, assuming they're locked in and still eating, um, yeah, and have a fire extinguisher. That's another one, uh, Ball Python Project. And, and Pops, if you're on here, I, I can't tell you how many times I've told you I need to buy a fire extinguisher. And for some reason, it never sticks in my head. I'll turn around or I'll open my phone like I do a million times a day, and it just slips my mind. Chris, order a fire. I should, I should end this podcast right now and go buy a fire extinguisher. Literally, I should. That should be a priority over this stream. But you know what? One of you guys are going to DM me and remind me, please. I should get – give me 50 DMs tomorrow to buy a fire extinguisher. They got these cool ones. They're like a ball where there's like a fire. You're like, fuck you, fire. And you like you like throw you know the, uh, the extinguisher on the fire. That's really cool. They got ones that you can mount up on the ceiling that are self-detonating. Like I'm not talking about the like – I'm talking like – you're sleeping and there's a fire and it's like boom and it like puts the fire out. Like that is the type of backup I want. I also have a smoke detector that is um, Wi-Fi. Now, I mean, well, f me if the if the internet goes out, I guess. But but um, we have a smoke detector in the room that's like Wi-Fi. 
So, so right, F you fire. Right. I even like I hate even like you know how people like compliment something like that's fire. Like I'm like almost like kind of like weird about even saying that because that's like the snake breeder's like worst nightmare. Drunken hog, if you're still on here, I know you you use fire to make your food, but that's a no-no for us. So anyway, um yeah, that might like, totally like I just saw that comment go by and I appreciate that. That's why we have each other's backs, guys. Like and that's why you always should pay attention to what people are saying around you and this and that. Like I just saw someone say fire extinguisher, and like it's great. And and that's why doing these and putting myself out there has chiseled me out and trimmed the fat off, even though I'm fatter than ever now. But metaphorically speaking, um, anytime I've put my face in front of the camera, it's never been perfect, and I don't expect it to be. And <clears throat> I get feedback just like I did there with the extinguisher, and it, it makes me a better breeder and a better person. So I would highly encourage you to do that yourself. To, to all you guys, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> about the whistle. Um, how many males? Look, if he's if he's uh, feeding and breeding, man, you put a lot, a lot. I don't know. That's that's uh, probably as many as you have. I would say in general. I, I I don't know. That's probably not a good answer. I don't know who you are. I don't know how many you have. Um, I don't know. My banana clown female maker's first year. I think he sired like ten clutches. Thank you. Appreciate it. What's the smallest enclosure for a female ball python? I got these um, ARS um, 50 series. I think they're hybrids. They're, um, they're probably like, this is probably a terrible example. It looks better on YouTube. They're like this long by that. But anyway, I think they're like 11 inches wide and they're like 33 inches deep or 28 inches deep. Tighter than you probably, probably think. How many locks should happen before I stop putting the mail in? It's very subjective. Um, once a month, just keep going until they ovulate. I, I need to get in the habit of using my left hand. I'm blocking the camera on, on YouTube. Um, what's the thoughts on paint and centennial? Uh, I think I was asked that the other night. Um, beautiful. I, I don't know much about them. All right. Let's see. Moving on. Tell us. what are Who are you wearing today? I'm wearing me. That's me, baby. I don't know anyone else that owns this exact shirt. I got it from a company and I thought I was going to get scammed. It like never came in the mail. I paid like 60 bucks for this shirt. <laughs> All right. But it finally came. How many snakes you have? What's your favorite snake in your collection? I own about 250 heads right now. A lot of those are hatchlings. Some are for sale. It's like, as far as my, my core stock, I would say it's like 200. Um, and that's a lot, includes a lot of babies, a lot of sub adults. I don't have a 200 head adult core. Um, as far as like breedable adults, maybe a hundred, and I don't have enough males to get to all those. Um, my favorite snake is um, my leopard highway. How many snakes you have? Okay, I already answered that one. This is great tonight. Yeah, that was going to be my Tenley shirt. It was. It didn't come in for Tenley though. I thought I was getting scammed. I actually have an open credit card dispute on this. I thought it wasn't coming, and it came. So I got. I guess I got to cancel that. It's on record. I got it now. Right. Um, I have a female that has rub marks. Other than that, she's great. What do you do to treat? Look, uh, most of the rub marks are going to take care of themselves. Um, if they're really bad, um, they'll, they'll shed, and, and you'll, you'll almost see part of the, the – like a corner of the, the jaw underneath almost recessed in. Ball pythons don't heal like humans where we regrow skin um, for the most part. If, if they've pushed back or ripped or like scarred up, you know, soared up part of it, it's going to almost kind of be gone. Um, I know it sounds terrible, but um, they, they still eat. They're fine. Uh, I have one snake that's a duck bill. It don't even have a chin, and it still eats. Like They don't need their chins exactly, so don't worry about it. Uh, Neosporin, polysporin, the, uh, the non-pain medication kind is fine for that. Appreciate the question. Mere mortal morphs, I believe that was. Okay. What is your dream? Erp, erp. Uh, already answered that. Appreciate the question, though. Favorite combo. Have you ever had a girl still eating up to dropping eggs? I don't think so. Um, most of my girls go off feed like a month before they ovulate. Almost all of them. I rarely have a snake eat up until ovulation. I, and it can happen for sure, but most of mine go off feed like a month before ovulating, if not more. 
do you put anything for your rats to chew on in the tubs with them? It's a great question, actually. And um, I wish Pops is here, man. I will let him riff on that, but I'll answer for him. Um, yeah, Dad, actually, he bought like a quarter uh, cattle, uh, you know, got a cow, a quarter. He bought a quarter of a cow that was butchered recently, local grass fed. And he got like, he has to do for like a big bag of bones. And um, he's been throwing them bones in there and he like lets them eat the meat. And like when we clean every Sunday, like I drop these like bones down to the new tub. So they chew on bones. Dad's uh, chopped up you know, pieces of uh, two by fours for them to chew on. Don't do treat it. Um, he's put in deer antlers, just anything like that. It's great. I think it's fantastic to put chew things in for him. It might help you with chew outs. Okay, let's move on to the next question. When your males stop eating, so you stop pairing, um, when a male stops eating, do you stop pairing or just give him a lot of rest if his condition is still good from Central Coast pythons? Someone just said in YouTube, I'm going to invest $100,000 in the ball python. Um, please um, slide into my DM. I can, I can take care of that for you. I can help you spend that. <laughs> anyway, kidding. Well, not really, I'm not, but <laughs> going to be putting more on Morph Market. I was going to do before this, but I was getting StreamYard ready for um the the, the the broadcast i'm happy i did that instead anyway there's always time to post snakes later there's nothing wrong with sitting on inventory they just get bigger and customers love that um to answer your question um look if the males i'll put i'll put it this way if he stays above 700 grams and not eating i will keep reading him pretty much in the schedule i was talking about earlier and um often man they'll, they'll hold their weight well they don't like I've never had a snake drastically drop weight. They might lose like 10 grams a month. That's nothing. Um, I've never had something just dramatically drop. Um, a lot of my males, I got to switch over from rats to mice during breeding season. I do that. No issue if I'm going back to rats and uh, get a meal in once a week. Let's go, baby. If they go off eat, that's no issue at all. That's why that's why I like waiting for them to be eight, 900 grams in a year old because if they do go off feed. I got like a six month cushion at least. And they like to eat, like they'll, they'll eat again, try different things, especially the mice trick. That works a lot. Hey pops, Carla said, hi, would you be interested in a meet in a meet with other breeders in Ohio? Yeah, for sure. I'd love to meet up. I don't have any people over my facility. Uh, I'm real weird about that. I don't like my location being disclosed to anybody. Um, 100%, you know, be glad to meet up for sure. All right. Oh, there's there's a pops question. Last session, someone asked, why do you why do your rats sneeze? Of course, it could be dust. If it continues, it's most probably. And sorry, pops, it it cuts you off at like you know two, three sentences. Um, we. When we first started breeding rats, we had some sneezing, but I think it was because they're on like fresh bedding. The sneezing at this point, I'm glad it's super rare that we'll get sneezes. I'll have feeder tubs filled up with like 100, 100 rats and you like don't hear no sneezes. Uh, I think uh, like a new bedding, like, you know, movement, maybe they're stressed, this and that, or it could be a cold. Um, you know, yeah, and like CB Constrictor said, 15, 20% body weight losses, no issue assuming you're starting off. Um, good. Oh, that's Carla. Hey, Carla. Carla Legacy, beloved reptiles. Haven't seen you in a long time on social media. Uh, girl, I'm glad you're on here. Uh, you know, you, you've been so kind and supportive over the years. Uh, I really hope you're well. And um, I didn't realize it was you at first. So uh, good to see you. Uh, I'd like to see more of you. All right. Let's go on to more questions. It's going great. I love it, guys. Central Coast. Pythons, what do you think of Stranger? I think it's fantastic. Um, you know, like I said the other night, like, uh, mahogany reminds me a lot of stranger. Um, I don't think they're the same, but, um, I think that might be the poor man's route, but, uh, you know, a lot of cool stuff. I love them dark snakes for sure. I'd love to see that being worth more. Um, and gene does every, uh, a gene that every collection needs by Tyler's toxic balls. Um, and she, Got to have that. Uh, you're not a ball python breeder if you don't own pastel. And um, she get you a clown and a pie, and uh, get you everything. You know, like like uh, like one of my my uh, late mentors always told me. You want your your ball python collection to 
when someone shops with you, you want to be like a candy shop with all the different candies, not just like two products. What more so fast? Pie balls? And pretty much anything. It's a strong market. It's very strong. So, you know, lots of opportunities. No question. Just thank you for all the, the great content. I love you. Thanks, Derek. Sean, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. That means a lot to hear that. Thank you. Okay, got a long one here. How long should I wait to consider force feeding? We're paused on Instagram. All right, here we go. How long should I wait to consider force feeding? I have a fully grown female and she hasn't ate in four weeks. No, 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 no. <sighs> Don't ever force feed an adult like like ever. I mean, I mean, I guess I can't say ever, ever, but <laughs> I've had adults go out feed for like a year. I wouldn't recommend it. There's no point in it. Um, just do other things like change your bedding type, give them a fresh tub, a different location in a rack, maybe put a male in for 10 minutes. It'll pop them back on feed, change the, the rodent type. I would not force feed an adult unless it's like about to die and bends. Uh, as far as hatchlings, I'll go ahead and answer that part, even though you didn't ask that. Um, hatchlings, assuming they, they absorbed a good amount of yolk, uh, I think they can go a month for sure with no no force feeding. I think I've gone two months, two and a half months of them skipping meals weekly before I've gone to the last resort of us. Now, I don't like calling it force feeding. It's assist feeding. Uh, on my YouTube, if you search Ball Pythons 101 and assist feed, it'll pop right up. I have a, a good video showing how to assist feed. And it's, it's very non-invasive. It doesn't stress them out. And typically after a couple of those, they'll, they'll eventually switch over. Just patience. Okay, let's see what else we got here. I don't know. Let's see. Um, how much would a female banana inchy pastel clown be worth? I can't find any online. Very hard to answer that. Uh, banana inchy pastel clown. Banana inchy pastel clown. Mm. I think a banana inchy clown would at least be worth twenty five hundred. Ah, they're not going to get a whole lot extra for the pastel. 2,500, we'll call it that. It's very subjective. It's hard to answer that. You gotta look at what the snake looks like, weight, size, who the breeder is. Um, it really, it really, um, you know, takes uh, a lot into it to, to answer that question appropriately. How many more males do you need for your females? I need a lot. And now um, that's uh, one thing I want to to discuss. People, people are like, buy your females first. Uh, wait two years to buy your males. I think that's it's loosely a good general rule. I would say like a year max. In fact, buy them at the same time probably. There's nothing wrong with having a nice, chunky, stud male in your collection. It's fantastic uh, to have a nice stud male that's mature that you can you can rely on. Them, them stud males, you're going to give you a lot better results than them young males. They really will. Um, I don't know. I don't have it like – ready in my head to answer that question. I'm not going to sit here and do math or anything, but, oh man, um, just a lot. <laughs> you need a lot of males, a lot, a lot more than I have. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much, you know, the males I do have are powerful. I got about 12 males that are studs and I have come ups that I'm growing up like an additional 12 or so. Um, and that's light. That's very light for the, the operation I'm running. It's almost embarrassing. So but I need to buy more mails. <laughs> Hit me up if you got any for Bill. <laughs> All right. I'm going to check the comments a little bit. We're getting a little dry on the submitted questions, it looks like. But, man, I appreciate all the interaction, guys. It's been fantastic. I think we're coming up on an hour in about seven minutes on Instagram. YouTube, we started like two minutes after. Um, oh, yeah, I just scrolled up and saw the fire extinguisher, um, you know. Yeah, and like, like Billy was saying from Mutation Creation, I mean, you know, he goes through every two weeks and, and checks all the hot spots. That's a great thing to do. Um, you know, once every week or two, go through with your temp gun and check every hot spot. That way, you know, all your heat tape or heat cables working. Check your, you know, your heat probes once every week or two. Um, it's just standard things to check. Just like when we clean our rats, every time we move a tub, we're checking to make sure the water nozzle works. Um, it's just standard things that are going to bail you out. Um, you know, sooner than later, if you find a problem. 
And occasionally we do find a rat nozzle, a water nozzle for our rat racks that is not working. And we have to go find a clog in the line. It's very rare, but if we didn't check that, those rats would die. Just like your snakes. If you don't check that probe and it gets dislodged, they're going to die or something. So you got to check that stuff. Um, just got to be on top of your game, man. You can't sleep. When people get sloppy um, and they, 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 they start slipping up, um, it's going to catch up to you. Nature always wins in the end. It always wins, and it will defeat you. And, and it's almost like a battle with nature, not, not to sound like uh, conflicting, but you've got you gotta you to gotta play on the same level that nature's playing on because it will beat your ass. Better believe it. Rats are very interesting. I enjoy my rats about as much as my snake. We love them. And, and you know, I really appreciate what Pops does with the rats, and I love being in there um, you know, as much as I can to help him out with that. It's awesome. You need to be in there more. And, uh, love you, Pops. Rats 101, you give them a follow. Ball pythons, don't have no ball pythons um, in this room. But uh, hopefully in the future we can start, you know, we can start going going live with some rat, some snakes and rats. It would be great. Do, do a podcast in the uh, in the rat room. That would be awesome. What morph would you recommend? Hey, Pops, what, what morph would you recommend I add as a new female? I have a head pied female and a pastel clown female, Xanthic ultra male. Uh, if you go to my page and hit the link in bio, can help you out slide into my dm i will help you out with that all right let's see what else we're at where's the questions at? here they are uh here's a question in the comments how often do you have to get new breeding stock for rats it's a great question um we keep our breeder females once they go into rotation to start breeding um they they're usually like four months old. Then we put them into rotation and then we start breeding them. They get a one week off period after we wean their rats on week three. We will breed them for a, a, at least a year. And if they're in good shape, they got good body weight, good fat reserves, we'll continue to breed them maybe a couple more times. But we start calling them off a little bit right around a year or a little bit later. Um, we try not to go more than two two line bred generations on them. Um, when we first started our colony, we were going like five, six, maybe even seven generations where you're like breeding like daughter back to like father. And we started getting a lot more um, smaller litter numbers, maybe some more tumors it seemed like. So um, if you can get new bloodlines in, do it. Um, you can strategically um, – um, intermix. If you start off with like four or five different bloodlines, you can strategically intermix them and keep intermixing them. And you can keep your like F1, F2, F3 um, you know, bloodlines pretty consistent. You don't need to always be bringing it in. Um, Terrence Hawkins, I don't know if he's on here, but um, he's like a local guy that we get a lot of new bloodlines from. So he's helped us out a ton. And, and it, it goes back to where we got to have each other's backs. Um, you know, he lost his whole rat colony this summer due to a uh, AC malfunction. Um, and we were able to get him back on his feet. So you always got to keep a circle of people around you where you lift them up and they can lift you back up when you're down. So that's uh, one of the best things about um, you know the human effect. Thanks, Pops. Thank you, Wild Inside Exotics. Appreciate it. All right, maybe one more, one more, one more. Because I think we're about at our hour here, and I'd rather say goodbye before it cuts me off. Um, I think I'll just go ahead and build the end of this. I think we have like one or two more minutes before it cuts us off on Instagram. Guys, appreciate you guys tuning in on this. Um, it means a lot. It's fun for me. This is um, definitely, it's helping me be a better speaker, trying to get in a zone. I believe it or not, I get nervous before these and it kind of goes away. Um, trying to like talk at a better, slower cadence and uh, bring value. And it's, it helps me out as a person to do these. Um, I really appreciate it. I appreciate all of you guys. Love you guys. Thank you guys so much. Fire extinguisher. There you go. Thank you. When I get off here, I am ordered a fire extinguisher. Yes, sir. All right, guys. See you next time. Love you guys. Have a great night. Yes. YouTube. Ba -ba -ba Boom. See you guys next time. Yes.